Welcome to Whiteboard Wednesday. My name is Drew Schul, Vice President of Global Product Strategy with Imperva. Today's topic is challenges of detecting insider threats, particularly when we're talking about sensitive data and large repositories of data like databases, big data systems, and file repositories. We're going to start off with insider threat profiles. I've got three already here, compromised, careless, and malicious. Let's look at compromised users. Uh, this is where most of the security industry is focused. When we think about compromised users, um, think about users that have clicked on a phishing link, users that have gotten their endpoint infected somehow through malware, and now the attacker is inside the network. Um, they're perhaps moving laterally through the organization, doing reconnaissance, trying to find where sensitive data is and compromise additional credentials to get access to it. If you look at the security solutions that uh, organizations are implementing today, endpoint security, sandboxing, uh, anti-phishing, a lot of the security solutions are really designed to look for this use case and, and try to stop it as, as soon as possible to quarantine the, co the compromised user. Two more, I'd say, overlooked um, user profiles, careless or negligent users. These are folks, think of a DBA that's got legitimate access to the network, um, but is using shortcuts to get a job done. Uh, maybe they don't want to go through the change control process and they're using an application service account to connect to the database instead of their named account. Now they're basically uh, eliminating any, any um, visibility into who that user is by borrowing another account. Um, a lot of times organizations are, are basically blind to this type of behavior because the DBA has access to everything. It's an area that security doesn't necessarily understand what's going on, what should be going on. And in general, um, no alarm bells are going to be going off for you know, compromised detection when it's careless behavior. Similarly for malicious users, these are users that have legitimate credentials. Um, they're able to log in to do their job, but maybe they're being extorted. Maybe they're taking um, you know, information to their next job. Uh, Ponymon reports 69% of exiting employees admit to taking data with them. Right? So it's not necessarily someone um, that, that is an Edward Snowden, but maybe someone that's just taking data with them to their next job because they think they're entitled to it. So when we look at these two categories, this is an area I think that is an area for improvement within the security industry and something that's going to require looking at new technology and new uh, approaches to solve all three use cases, not just the compromised uh, threat profile. So why is detection so difficult? Why haven't we solved this problem? Why do we continue to see these very, very large breaches you know, 60, 80, 100 million records at a time. That's coming from a database, by the way. That's not coming from a spreadsheet on someone's laptop that got left at an airport, right? That's coming from a huge data repository within the enterprise. Well, part of the problem is these users have legitimate access. They're on the network. They work there. They have legitimate access. So when we look at this, it's not necessarily about um, IAM. It's not about access control. Really what it's about is it's about post login detection. I need to see what the user did after they logged in and is that behavior normal or not. And that's one of the biggest challenges is understanding good versus bad. We're looking at millions and millions of transactions against a database or a big data environment, a big data lake. How do you determine the, the good versus bad? What are some of the approaches people are taking? Today, uh, in some cases, they're sending the information to the SOC, right? They're sending the information to the SOC maybe through raw logs that they're then writing correlation rules against. Maybe they've got other um, security layers within the environment that they're trying to piece together to understand this picture. But in most cases, they don't have a very good picture of this post-login behavior to be able to understand good versus bad. And the result is alert overload. So in the case of Target, they had information sent to their SIM within the SOC environment, but they weren't able to find it. They weren't able to, to get to the actionable data. And the last problem, and I think this is one of the biggest ones, is these large enterprises have dozens or hundreds or thousands of applications within the environment, and they're all serving different um, business uh, uh, units and business requirements. And you've got one team, the security team, that's responsible for deciphering all this good versus bad and users and applications and others within the organization accessing data. And so this lack of context is really something that um, is not going to be solved through predictive static policies, is not going to be solved through um, you know, just liaisoning with the business units. You really have to have something more advanced to be able to um, understand the good versus bad, to be able to, to sort through the alerts and to be able to provide some context to that team so they can, they can actually go quarantine and follow up and deal with an insider uh, threat once it's detected. All right, so we talked about user profiles. Let's next talk about data. And I think what this really comes down to is when we're looking at the, the challenges of detecting insider threats, it's really at the intersection of users and data. 
this is this is essentially where the data breaches are happening when we talk about insider threats. Uh, Verizon data breach uh, report that comes out every year has indicated that in a lot of the cases where we see very, very large amounts of data um, through the forensics and the analysis, it was an insider, it was someone already within the organization, again, a comp compromised, careless, or malicious user. So let's look at the data. Um, you know, when, when we start talking about big data, databases, file systems, especially databases, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot more here than just the IP address and the username. We want to understand more about that user, where they came from, what type of application they were using, which department they're part of, really the context of that user as they're interacting with data. Um, and when we start getting into some of these other things, um, you know, the database uh, table, the schema, the SQL operation that was performed against that database, for example, we start to get further and further away from the comfort zone of the security team that's responsible for protecting this data. And again, this is where we have that, that uh, issue with context, is not only do we have hundreds or thousands of applications, but now we've got sort of a different language that's not very familiar or comfortable for the security team when we start looking at this amount of data. But the key thing is this, is, this is really the type of data, this deep understanding that we need to be able to fill in and address some of these challenges that we talked about earlier. Um, so what, what is everyone doing within the industry? If you've been to the RSA conference, if you've been to any security show recently or talked to a vendor, chances are they're telling you about machine learning and how machine learning, behavioral analytics, how user behavioral analytics, UBA, is going to help solve this problem. And in some cases, in very narrow uh, focused use cases, it's doing a great job and is really bringing security to the next level. But the key thing to note is that machine learning, um, the key thing here is it's... Uh, it's not magic, right? There's no, there's no magic potion here that we can just apply a machine learning or artificial intelligence against the data set and expect to get good results. You've got to start with a very key uh, laser-like focus on which problems you're trying to solve. And that really leads us to um, the next section here, which is key indicators of abuse. Um, so one of the things that we've done here at Imperva is really taken a laser-like approach to um, things like service account abuse and machine takeover, excessive database or file access and done that in the context of a deep understanding of how users interact with data. And this is really the key to getting some value out of machine learning, but also solving this uh, insider threat profile problem, is having a deep, deep understanding of this intersection between users and data. Okay, so we talked about machine learning and user behavior analytics, and I briefly mentioned um, predefined static policies in an earlier part of the talk. Um, the challenge with this approach, even if I've got a very granular ability to set uh, policies to do real-time alerting and blocking is uh, factoring in the unknown. So if we kind of go back and look at uh, the previous approach to insider threats, it was mainly about compliance. So for example, PCI and compliance. Had a very tight, uh, narrow scope in terms of what I was looking for, and in fact the environment was usually very controlled and uh, oftentimes set aside from the rest of the environment. As we start to look at insider threats across the broader environment, across the broader data set, think of uh, Europe's GDPR, where we're looking for personally identifiable information, which could be all over the enterprise, the, the problem now is, is, is much more challenging. Uh, we have to think about uh, and anticipate every single mutation of a policy and every variation of how that policy would need to be created. The challenge here is now you're, you're creating hundreds or thousands of policies, you're having to maintain those, and behind that or underneath it, the application environment's changing constantly. So it becomes uh, an operational challenge for an organization to sustain. The other issue is a lot of times the insider threats are unanticipated. We're not thinking about all the potential variables of a policy that would need to be created in order to find it. So when we look at the database uh, example um, and, and why static policies don't scale, um, we have to understand who's connecting to the database, um, how do they connect, are they using SQL Plus, Toad, Aqua Data Studio, some other type of tool um, to connect to the database, uh, what data are they accessing, have I done data classification before, do I even know the context of that data to be able to write a policy against it. Um, what do their peers do? Is this person doing something that no one else within the DBA group or no one else within the IT group or finance or whoever that group is? Is that something that we can use as part of the correlation? Um, you know, how much data do they normally query? Well, unless I have a baseline and a deep understanding of SQL, first of all, to understand um, what the amount of data is or what a query is or how many rows are coming back from a database, 
Um, you know, this is a this is something that that can be difficult to quantify. Um, you know, when do they normally work? That seems like a pretty basic one. But if I look at basically, what do I need to do to detect insider threats? I need to be able to correlate across you know these five examples, these six examples, as well as well as many others, and then all the the possible mutations of that. So it becomes a real challenge. And uh, as we get into the next section, we're going to be talking about machine learning, very focused machine learning, so that I don't have to worry about setting and maintaining you know, hundreds or thousands of predictive static policies over time. So I talked about the intersection of users and data and having a deep understanding of those users interacting with data to solve this problem. What CounterBreach does is it essentially uses uh, machine learning to automate the understanding of all of the different variables, uh, both the user variables and data variables in such a way that we can make sense of all this and address the context issue, uh, address the false positives, address the uh, not having to create static predefined policies issue. So one of the first things we do is we actually identify um, user and connection types. So what does that mean? Um, in the database world, one of the biggest challenges our customers have is just differentiating application service accounts connecting to the database versus interactive users or privileged users like DBAs connecting the database because they perform and have different uh, uh, responsibilities. So if we understand uh, the different users, in some organizations that's a huge win. I worked with a large payment processing company that literally had a rat's nest of, of legacy connections to the database. They didn't know who was what. And just by going in and automatically differentiating based on behavioral statistics and, and algorithms, hey, this connection is an application based on velocity, based on what it does, how it connects to the database. We can, we can automatically detect and say, hey, this is a service account. Based uh, on the differentiation, we can also say, hey, this is a DBA that's connecting into the database. So once we've understood the connection types, and oftentimes that's a huge win for the organization, the second thing we want to understand is what is the typical purpose of that account in terms of how it accesses data? So we see an application account, we've profiled that, we understand it's an application account. We're going to see it um, access sensitive data applications. So typically it's acting on behalf of users, let's say on a, on a um, healthcare portal, that are interacting with the application and updating sensitive PII information. So we're going to see certain database operations, certain SQL calls, or get certain tables within the database and be able to classify that at that granular level. So when we talk about a deep understanding of data, that's what I'm talking about is not just the, the connection, but the operations, the, basically the, the SQL uh, operations that are being performed against which data. So this is dynamic data classification. By the same token, we see DBAs also interacting with the database. They need to maintain, again, the performance, uptime, and availability. And what we typically see is they're accessing in, in metadata. So I shouldn't see um, the same operations uh, against the, uh, the same tables that the application is doing uh, from a DBA user. So one of the common things that we see with CounterBreach is we see a DBA now that's normally accessing this data that we've seen over a period of time and built that profile, that good behavior profile, all of a sudden accessing sensitive data because we've profiled that this is sensitive data from the application. Hope you enjoyed the session. I hope it was useful and join us next time for Whiteboard Wednesday.